So, uh, my name is Zach. I'm an engineer at Flox. Uh, and today I'm going to show you uh, kind of intro to Flox and then some of my favorite features. So, first question what is Flox? So, Flox is a virtual environment and package manager all in one. So, virtual environments, if you've never heard of those before, in the Python, Python ecosystem, you have this concept of a virtual environment which is essentially project scoped dependencies, tools, et cetera. So Flux gives you these same kind of environments, but across any language ecosystem. And it also serves as a package manager. So with Flux, you create environments that layer, and they provide dependencies just where it matters. So let's talk about what that means for just a moment. So home sweet home. How much time have you spent tweaking your shell prompt, your color scheme, selling your favorite utilities, making your own shell aliases, and customizing your IDE. Probably more time than you want to admit, but we all do it, so it's fine. Um, often when you work inside of a container or a VM, all that stuff is thrown out the window. So you spin up a container, you SSH into it, or you connect your editor to it, whatever the case may be, no longer have your shell aliases, it's black and white, it just doesn't feel like home, right? Um, you spent all this time making your machine comfortable for you, working the, making it work the way that you want it to work, because when your machine is set up the way that you want to work, you're more comfortable and you're more productive. Often when you work in a container, all that's thrown out the window. Somebody just came in and kind of cleared off your desk. So Flux environments are also portable, but they're not just portable across machines, they're also portable across CPU architectures, different operating systems, and the software lifecycle. So the environment that you use to develop in is also the environment that you use in CI, and it's also the environment that you can use in production. So Flux isn't based on containers, and that's one of its killer features. But you can bundle up a Flux environment into a container, right? So like containers are great for deployment and distribution. They have, you know, there's definitely good use cases for containers, obviously. They've kind of taken over the uh, DevOps world for a reason. And so Flux lets you use environments the way that you want to use them while you're developing, but it also gives you uh, kind of like, it builds a bridge to the world of deployment in case you want to use it there. So. All that, those are like all the hooks for getting you interested in Flux. But as an engineer, my favorite part about it is its composition, both in its usage and its implementation. And so we're going to talk a little bit about each of those pieces as we go. But uh, as I introduce you to Flux, we're going to do this by kind of looking over the shoulder of an engineer named Sebastian. And so Sebastian is a full stack developer. And he just joined a company called FurFinder. So FurFinder is an early stage startup. Uh, and they're developing a dating app for cats to help them find love, because <laughs> everybody deserves love. Uh, and so uh, Sebastian negotiated a title bump when he joined the company, because it's startup world. And so being a full stack developer, his new title is Lord of the Stack, full in its splendor. So. Uh, FurFinder is also an enlightened Flux user. So that's going to be our end to Flux. But Sebastian's not the only character. We're also going to talk about his roommate, Lord V's Trigger. So uh, anybody who's lived with a cat knows that you don't own a cat. You cohabitate with a cat. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, so let's go ahead and dive in. So what does onboarding look like at FurFinder? Well, it looks like onboarding at pretty much any other company. You set up direct deposit, set up all your accounts, you add Slack emojis that you've accumulated over you know, the last decade to your company Slack, you suss out the internal politics, don't mention that topic to that person, uh, otherwise a flame war will ensue, and you flood Slack with cat photos to establish pet cuteness dominance, got them be on top, and then you set up a development environment. And this is kind of where it starts to look different from other companies. So, First step, you install Flux. Flux provides uh, devs, RPMs, and a uh, graphical installer for Mac OS. So Flux works on Mac, Linux, no problem. 
and then you Flux activate, and that's really it. And that's one of the killer features of Flux, and so we'll show you that in just a moment. So, time for demos. I'm gonna set the remote down over here. We're gonna hop over to my terminal, which is Fisher Price sized for me, but just right for you. All right, so, um, Sebastian just joined FurFinder. It's kind of his second day. He's gone through the whole, like, welcome to the company rigmarole. And one of the engineers, uh, is kind of a gray beard, just gave him some instructions to help him get started with uh, Flox. So we're gonna walk through some of those instructions. So uh, we're gonna go into an onboarding directory. We're gonna see there's nothing in here. Empty directory. So the first thing we're gonna do is Flox init. This is how you create a new environment, all right? And so uh, you can already see some interesting stuff in here. So I'm gonna point out, it says uh, created environment onboarding. This is the name of the environment. And the name is taken from the current directory uh, that you created the environment in. So you can rename it to something else later if, you know, your, <laughs> if your directory is named something, you know, not particularly uh, descriptive. Um, the next thing is this AR64 Linux. So this is one of the first interesting features of Flux. So Flux environments are system aware. So they know what types of systems they can run on and they know what kinds of systems they can't run on. Um, and this is one of the things that makes Flux environments portable. So you, uh, the packages you install know what systems they run on, know what systems they're available for in the first place. Um, and that kind of bubbles up all the way through the entire environment. So I'll show you a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, so when you create the environment, you're given some instructions or some kind of like next steps. And so one of the things that we've really tried to provide with Flux is a really killer user experience. And so we try to leave you these breadcrumbs so that whenever you do something, you know where to go next. So you created an environment. Here are some next things to try out. Um, so I mentioned that Flux is a package manager um, in addition to a variety of other things. Um, and so we have the common like search install, uninstall, basic stuff you'd expect from any other package manager. So let's go ahead and search. So we're gonna search for hello. All right, so we get a bunch of results. The package that we want is the first one here. Uh, but there's some other kind of like interesting stuff going on. You see that some of these package names have dots in them, so what's going on there? So the software that you can install with Flux comes from what we call the Flux catalog. Uh, and so the catalog has a hierarchical structure to it. So some packages are at the top level. Uh, so like hello, curl, stuff like that. And then we also have what are called package sets. And so these are often like namespaces for language specific, specific ecosystems. There's also one for uh, Mac OS specific packages called Darwin, stuff like that. So what you see here is SBCL packages dot something. And so SBCL packages is the Steel Bank Common Lisp <laughs> package set for all of your modern Common Lisp development needs. Um, yeah, and so we also have packages for Emacs. So you have the ability to configure your editor to some degree with, with Flux as it stands today. Um, and so we also have another one of these breadcrumbs that says Flux show. So let's just Flux show. Hello. All right, we run that. So we get a lot of the same information at the moment. You get the name of the package, uh, the description, and then we see the version, okay? So right now there's only one version because as it stands today, the Flux catalog provides you uh, essentially just one uh, revision or a copy of the catalog. Uh, and something that we're working on the, in the immediate future is providing kind of a more historical catalog. So you have a wider variety of versions that are available to you uh, in the near future. But let's go back to the instructions that it, uh, we were given. So we did our search. Let's now do our install. Flux install hello. Okay, pretty quick. So uh, that was basically instant. Uh, part of the reason is that package is already cached locally for me uh, because the conference Wi-Fi is under extreme duress. <laughs> uh, and so to ward off any, you know, uh, demo hiccups. I've already run this demo a few times, right? Um, but <clears throat> uh, 
basically any package that's on your system that has been installed in any other environment will be this fast to install. So one of the things that, we, that I really love about Flux and one of these uh, aspects of composition is that Flux environments are composed at the package level. So say that you have a collection of Docker containers and you decide, ah, I want to add the same package to each of those. Okay, you go to your Docker files, you find your monster run command that's doing apt update, apt install, all of the things. You add your extra package there. Now it has to reinstall all of those packages and then any other layer layers that came after it, right? And then you have to do the exact same thing, rebuild all the previous, all the subsequent layers and all the other uh, Docker images that you wanted to add that package to. But really, when you get down to it, you're just redoing a bunch of work, right? So like, what is package installation? You download a file, you put it somewhere, you might run some installation scripts, and that's it. So why are you having to repeat that same work for multiple Docker images? And why are you having to re <laughs> rebuild all the layers that came after it? Not great. With Flux, you have, like I said, your environments are composed at the package level. So when you download a package once, it's on your system, and adding it to any other environment really boils down to updating some sim links and some text files, and it's done like that. So that's why this is so fast. All right, so let's go ahead and run this hello package. It's not going to be exciting. It just prints hello world. Oh no, hello is not found. What have I done? Have I screwed up my demo right out of the gate? No, I haven't. Sorry. Uh, not that exciting yet. Um, so we've installed our package into the environment, but we haven't activated the environment yet. So one of the other killer features of Flux environments is that they provide software and some other things that we'll get to in, in a moment when the environment is activated. And when it's not activated, the software is nowhere to be found. It obviously is on your machine somewhere, but it's nowhere accessible and it's not going to clutter up your system. Another feature of Flux is that it doesn't just scatter software into arbitrary locations on your system, so it's not leaving stuff in user lib, user bin, whatever. Um, so that's another kind of like nice feature of Flux. So let's go ahead and activate our environment. Okay, again, pretty quick. Uh, so it says, you are now using the environment onboarding at some path. To stop using the environment, type exit. So Flux environments are shells. So when you activate your environment, it puts you in a subshell. All right, so now let's go ahead and run our hello command. Hello world, hooray, my demo works as intended. Okay, so where is this hello package? Okay, so which hello? So we have home z Mitchell onboarding dot flocks and then some stuff. So as I showed you before, this directory was empty, but now if I do tree a, we see that we have this directory called dot flocks. And so this is where all the metadata for your environment is stored. So there's a handful of files in here, yada, yada, yada. The only one that you really have to care about is this manifest.toml. And honestly, if you don't want to care about it, you don't have to care about that one either because we kind of take care of this for you. So your environment definition is a declarative file. It's a TOML file. Uh, and so whenever you're running these package manager commands, install, uninstall, that kind of thing, what we're really doing is making edits to this manifest.toml file. And so the idea with this is that you can check in this .flux directory to source control and keep it alongside your code. But I'll demonstrate this in a moment. You don't just have to have this co-located with your code. You can also push environments up to Flux Hub, which uh, is our service that allows you to share and sync environments with your coworkers or across your entire organization, stuff like that. So let's go ahead and look at our manifests. We have a command called Flux Edit. So you can just run this command without having to know where your manifest is. So for instance, if you wanted to edit the manifest for a, uh, an environment that's on Flux Hub, that's how you would do it too. So there's a bunch of comments in here. So let's go ahead and delete these just to make it a little bit easier to read, especially on a small screen. Da, 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 da. Look at me, I know Vim. OK, so we have four sections. We have install, vars, hook, and options. So install, this is the section where you add packages that you want installed to your environment. So here we have hello. Um, 
We also have a virus section. So this is where you can set environment variables that you want to be present when you activate the environment. So like I said, Flux environments are shells. So when you enter the shell, you might want some environment variables set. You might use this to set like the URL, like the URL for your database or the port number for your development server, stuff like that. Um, the hook section is kind of interesting. So uh, this allows you to define scripts that are run or sourced um, uh, when you activate the environment. So when you enter the shell, we run a script, and you know, it does whatever you want. So a common use case for this would be you know, creating files and directories, doing initialization. Um, you, know, you could use it to set up a Postgres database scoped to your particular project. So you know, create my data directory here, create these, uh, the PG user, set the database URL and port, stuff like that. It's a great uh, use case for these uh, hooks. And the last section is this options thing. So these are settings for the environment itself. Um, and so the one here is systems. So I mentioned this before. Flux environments are system aware. And so this systems thing is a whitelist of systems that we know the environment will work for. Um, and so here, because I'm, on, I'm inside of an uh, AR64 Linux VM, uh, by default, it will create it with your current system. So if someone uh, on a Mac were to pull this, uh, it would say, hey, hey, that system's not on the whitelist. And it will give you the option to either just do it anyway um, and add your system to this list or bail out because you know it's not going to work for whatever reason. Um, the other thing that you can do, uh, because Flux environments are system aware, is we know that some packages just don't exist for certain systems. Right, so uh, you might say, I, I want to provide a debugger in my environment. So uh, you would say, you know, on Mac, provide LLDB. On Linux, provide GDB, something like that. So you can also mark packages as optional. So, you know, if it exists for this system, go ahead and add it. If it doesn't, don't worry about it. We'll move on with life, okay? So the instructions that uh, Sebastian were given, Sebastian was given, uh, want him to add an environment variable here. So he's going to go ahead and create a greeting. So he's going to say, hello. This is going to create a greeting environment variable in the shell. Um, and so as he's typing this out, Lord B. Stroger hops up on the couch and just starts mad-dogging him. Um, and so uh, <laughs> at that point, Lord B. Stroger starts to do a little tap dance on his keyboard. Lord B. Stroger, what are you doing? Oh my god, no. And at that point, Lord B. Stroger hits the escape key and then pause at colon X. Lord B. Stroger knows how to exit Vim, which is a power that even some humans don't possess. <laughs> so he hits exit, and we get this error. And so basically, this is Flock saying, buddy, your manifest is full of garbage. Uh, and so what's happening here is uh, demonstrating another feature, which is that when you make edits to your environment, uh, we actually do this transactionally. So we take all of your environment metadata, and we stick it in a temporary directory, and we let you make the edits there. And then when you're done, we try to build it to make sure that it's still functional. So we try to make sure that your environment is never left in a broken state. So if the environment, uh, if the build succeeds over there, we do an atomic replacement, and you have a new, uh, you know, your edit to the environment has been made. So, but let's say that you made a one character you know, error in one of your uh, variables or something like that. It'd be a shame if we wasted all the effort you put into making your edit. So we give you the opportunity to continue editing. So let's just say yes. And we will go ahead and delete the rest of that. And we can continue making our edit. And so this says, you know, you've made an edit to your environment that can't take place automatically, so you need to reactivate it. So I'm going to exit the environment just with Control D. It's a shell, so you could type exit or hit Control D. Activate the same thing, and now I'm going to say echo greeting. It says hello, right? Hooray! It worked. Um, now let's say that I was going to make an edit that is just full of straight garbage. Okay, so let's do that again. If I say no. It says, environment editing canceled. Great. It's protecting me from committing garbage to my environment. All right. So the, this is the end of like, the basic instructions for, uh, for using the environment. 
Um, if I wanted to add another package to the environment, let's just say rip grep. Okay, it's installed, and I can immediately use rip grep. So RG. I have demo fingers. They're a little fat right now. Um, so rip grep, you can use that automatically. So some things you can do without having to reactivate your environment. Other things take place, uh, well, other things you have to reactivate, right? Okay, so the next set of instructions says um, to try out uh, one of the Graybeard's environments that he created, all right? So let's exit this environment. We're gonna delete the one that's in this directory. So we're gonna say flux delete, all right? It gives us a prompt. Some of these prompts will be a lot less verbose about next week. Uh, we just released 1.0, like, Wednesday. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, as you can imagine, between that being at scale, there's a lot going on. So, uh, under active development, always looking for feedback. Uh, chime in, please. Um, so, it's asking us, are we sure that we want to uh, delete this? Yes, I am. Thank you. Okay, and we've deleted that environment. So, if I do ls, you see dot blocks is gone. Uh, it's doing some other cleanup under the hood, too, so it's not just uh, deleting that one particular directory. Um, so the next thing is to flux pull, I'm going to say Z Mitchell, modern dev env. So the graybeard gave him this environment to, to test out. Um, and so what this is doing is uh, stress testing the conference Wi-Fi. Um, uh, okay, done. So what this is doing is essentially making a local clone of an environment that's on Flux Hub. Okay, so if I do tree A again, you see we have a dot flux. The structure is a little different. You don't have to worry about that. Um, and so if we flux activate, we can see what's in this environment. So the next command is flux list. This shows you which packages are installed in the environment. All right, so for our modern development environment, we have Fortran for all of your modern Fortran development needs. Uh, SBCL, again, for common Lisp, and then uh, your basic for all of your modern basic interpreter needs. But Silly Graybeard has forgotten to include a language server uh, for his development needs. So let's say flux install Fortran language server. Okay, and cool. Now our uh, environment has a language server for Fortran. Why not? All right. So um, if I wasn't nervous about the conference Wi-Fi, I would push this back up to Flux Hub. Uh, and what this would do is uh, essentially add a new generation to that environment. Um, so environments that are on Flux Hub, uh, as I mentioned, all of the environments use transactions. And so environments on Flux Hub uh, have this concept of generations. So you can think about these as like different Git commits. So I've just created a new one locally, and I need to push it to Flux Hub. And then next time somebody pulls it, they will get Fortran language server. Lucky them. All right. So that is onboarding done. Where is the play button? There we go. All right. So, oh, my favorite feature, press pause. So second favorite feature. We'll get the, second, the other one later. So um, when you activate an environment, you get to keep all the dot files and stuff. I remember how I mentioned like home sweet home? You get to keep all that stuff. So uh, I have a alias for git log. Uh, let's just say git in it so that there's actually a git repository here. Um, so gl, C current branch master doesn't exist, blah, blah, blah. But I have a shell alias that works inside of my environment, despite the fact that git's not set up. Don't worry about that, right? So uh, you get to use all the stuff that you set up for yourself inside the environment, all right? So let's back out of that and go back. And so this fills, fills Sebastian with this feeling of joy, uh, and he just can't contain himself, so he feels like dancing. So I'm going to shut up and let you guys watch this guy dance so I can take a swig of water. Right? Cool. This is uh, documentary footage of Sebastian onboarding it for a finder. OK. I also know that. Any text I put on that slide you weren't going to pay attention to because you're going to be watching him dance anyway. All right. Yeah. Sprinkler, classic. Cool. Let's move on. So uh, Sebastian has onboarded. He's been working there for a little bit now. Um, and it's time for him to work on his first feature. So he's supposed to start working on the back end using a company-wide Rust environment and a back end specific environment. 
and he wants to set up the, the flow for cats to set up their profiles. All right, so we go back, more demos, all right? All right, so let's back out of this guy and go in here. So this is a Rust project. So the company has a company-wide Rust environment, so we're gonna activate that. Flux activate dash R is how you activate a remote environment, just kind of ephemerally. So we're gonna say Z Mitchell. We're gonna spell my own name right. Rust env. Okay, and again, we are going to stress test the conference Wi-Fi. Cool. All right, Flux list, let's see what's inside there. Uh, so we have, if you have uh, an active environment and there's another environment in the current directory, it gives you a prompt of which one to use. Again, this prompt is pretty verbose. It's going to get uh, tweaked next week. So we have Cargo, some other Rust utilities. We have some libraries that we know specifically that you need to compile a lot of Rust projects. Um, and then there's you know, the compiler and some other stuff. All right, so also in this, in this directory, we have another environment called backend. So we're just gonna flux activate and, uh, or it's, it is the backend environment, but it's named after the current directory. So let's just go ahead um, and list that one as well. So we have two utilities in here, uh, diesel CLI and diesel CLI X. So diesel is an ORM for Rust projects and it comes with the CLI for generating like uh, stubs and stuff like that. Um, so I'm not gonna walk you through the whole usage of that. We're just gonna run diesel setup. Oh, I need to, <laughs> oh, I spelled it wrong. <laughs> there we go. I was like, oh no. Okay, so we've run our migrations. We have a database set up. Now we're just going to uh, cargo build. Oh no, okay. Well, let's come over here. Uh, so we're kind of come back to this. So uh, while that's building, we're going to activate another environment called Net Tools. Um, so I'm going to run that once it's done building, um, and we're going to uh, just make some API requests against the back end. So we're going to say flux activate dash r z Mitchell Net Tools. Again, stress testing conference Wi-Fi. This should already be built. Yeah, what happened there? I don't know. Anyway, um, okay, so we have our net tools. Um, linker CC not found, what is that about? No, Rust comes with one. There's something that I messed up uh, in preparing. So the back end works, Rust compiles, trust me. Um, okay, so if I wanted to, I would then just do, uh, so let's flux list, see what's in here. Um, active environment. Uh, so we have curl, FX, some DNS tools, HTTP. We would just run uh, some commands, version, whatever. Okay, tools are there, you could use them. So um, barring live debugging of a Rust build, uh, this isn't even my Rust project, honestly, so I didn't, <laughs> I didn't build a uh, Tinder clone for cats, sorry. Uh, I copied somebody's random Rust and React project off of GitHub and uh, made it compile at some point in the past. Clearly it no longer compiles because I broke something. But uh, yeah, so I was just gonna make some requests against the back end and yeah, super exciting. Um, so let's move back to the presentation. So at this point, uh, Sebastian has set up the flow for cats to create their profiles, yada, yada, yada. And so it's time, time to do some user research. So he sets up a profile for Lord Beast Uh You can see that he's eight years old. Uh, his occupation is biscuit maker, and uh, he loves singing at 3 a.m. Uh, so on to the next one. So uh, here, let's go back over to the demos and do a quick demo of, uh, again, activating multiple environments. Uh, well, the back end's not gonna work because Rust, but there is uh, another environment in here called UI, so Flux activate. You can store more than one environment in a given, get direct, in a given project, so you activate uh, those by path with the dash D flag. So we're gonna say Flux activate dash D UI. Okay, so let's Flux list and see what's in there. 
Again, use the active one. So we just have Node.js in there. So we're going to say uh, cd into the UI directory and npm run dev. OK, starts the dev server. Trust me, it works. All right. So uh, at that point, uh, he has done the work of setting up the uh, like UI for this app. And so being a startup uh, in 2024, the uh, investors at FurFinder have asked, how are you going to make use of AI at your company? And so they've decided that you know, for their swiping flow, everybody's done swiping already, right? So uh, they need to make their mark. Um, and so what they've decided is they're going to use a sensor fusion algorithm based on AI to help decide when a cat either likes the profile they're looking at or doesn't like it. And so that kind of looks like this. So no thank you. You get the skippity paps, just bah, 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 get that shit out of here. No thank you. Or you get the slow paw knocking the phone off, at which point Lord Beastrugger looks up and says, Sebastian, you've let your phone fall. How could you let this happen? Uh, and Sebastian says, yes, my lord, I will pick up the phone. Thank you. All right. So Lord Peastrigger goes on a quest to find love. Eventually, he fi finds Phoebe and says, Sebastian, I found her, a, vis a vision of perfection. And they share some catnip. The rest is history. Furfinder goes on to become a unicorn. Sebastian can continue to afford uh, Lord Beastrugger's wet cat food, and the rest is history. All right, so that's it for the demos. Uh, I guess I can show you what Flockshub looks like. So this is what um, the this is what Flockshub looks like for a particular environment. Um, so you can see the packages that are installed in it. Um, you also have some commands on the left over here for. Uh, you can just copy them, and it will allow you to uh, run those commands to either activate the environment or pull it into whatever uh, project you're working on. And then I also, this also says current generation. So I mentioned before that there are generations for uh, environments on Flock Sub. So this is the current one. You also have this list of uh, essentially a, a change log. So these are the uh, generations that are present. And the changelog has kind of the same information. It says, uh, for instance, uninstalled Clang. It's probably where my C compiler went. Um, installed packages, da 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 da. And then sometimes you see manually edited. So if I, uh, if I flux edit to touch my manifest and add something there, um, it will say manually edited in the generation list. All right? So we will go back to this. All right. So Demos are done. Let's talk a little bit about why we built Flux and kind of how it's built. How does it work? So I mentioned that it's, it's not based on containers. So it works on my machine. This is a phrase that, depending on who you are, uh, might strike fear into your heart. Um, but really, this should just be a phrase that is a given, something you shouldn't have to say, like, I love you. Just kidding. Uh, but uh, it shouldn't have to be something that you uh, say with a shrug and an apology. Uh, and it shouldn't have to be something that you say to yourself as like words of affirmation, like, I'm a good developer, it works on my machine. I'm a good developer, it works on my machine. You shouldn't have to, that shouldn't have to be your attitude about working on software. So containers are fine, right? What's wrong with containers? Everybody uses them. So one issue is that uh, the build process could give you two different containers. So for a given Docker file, you might end up with different systems depending on when you run it. So for example, Ubuntu latest, depending on what day you run this, you might end up with two different releases of the operating system. Bad. Let's say you pin it to a specific version. Depending on what day you run that, you might get different patches, security fixes that have been applied, you know, fixes that have been backported, stuff like that. Two different systems. OK, uh, let's say that you're able to fix the base system. Then you go to run apt update, apt install. You still get different packages that are there, uh, depending on you know, updates that have been applied, stuff like that. Um, and even just very small changes in a piece of software can have unexpected impacts. So we build software on a mountain of other people's stuff, right? And so subtle changes at the base of that mountain can bubble up. So say that you uh, 
you install some package, it installs libfoo. You install another package that installs another version of libfoo, but it's slightly different. Say that it's even the same source code, but just a compiled with different flags. So 02 versus 03 for uh, optimizations. Now you have you know, potentially completely different behavior for uh, you know, some code path through that library. Well, now every piece of software on your, on your system that depends on libfoo, even transitively, behaves differently because the software is different, right? And you didn't ask for that. Like, you didn't, you didn't do anything different. You didn't change your software, but now it's working differently. So the other thing is that containers uh, and VMs, the way that you set them up is imperative. So for instance, you take a base system, either the from line in your Docker file, or say a fresh install the operating system uh, in your VM, and then you run a sequence of imperative commands to reach a desired state. It'd be nicer if you could just say what the desired state was. And so that's what we provide with this manifest.toml file. Um, so you do all that, yada, yada, yada. You build a container. Um, in order to do development, you have to then poke holes into it. What is that noise? Uh, 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 you have to poke holes into it uh, just in order to do development. So you have to set up volumes to you know, share a directory with the host machine. You have to forward ports just to be able to talk to stuff inside the container, yada, yada, yada. So it's kind of a pain. Yeah, mount a volume, port a port. So um, containers also don't compose very well. So I showed earlier we have, uh, say, a company-wide Rust environment and then a project-specific backend environment. So uh, in that case, you're composing two different environments. So let's also say that you had uh, two different languages that you need to, need to use at the same time. So here's an example. Uh, and this is an example, unfortunately, from uh, a previous job. Uh, <laughs> so you have a monorepo that contains two different projects. One is a Rust service that implements an uh, ML algorithm. The other is a Python kind of test harness to validate, measure, et cetera, basically just check on how the service is doing uh, in terms of accuracy. Um, and they're both under active development. And the killer here is that you're only allowed one Docker file for this whole repo. That sucks. Um, and so because these are both under active development, it doesn't really matter which order you put them in. You're just always going to get uh, rebuilds. And so uh, CI regularly took like 45 minutes because it was rebuilding the universe. Uh, yeah, you also had to adhere to name stages. You know, there was one for the builder, one for test, one for, you know, production, yada, yada, yada. Um, then you also had to bring in credentials from other images that were provided by, you know, Google, or, you know, anybody else. And like I said, cache and validation constantly, you're constantly rebuilding things, and that just kind of sucks. So all you really care about is your service and your test harness. You have these two projects that, uh, you know, you've done the work to make them really nice, and individually, they're awesome, and then you add in all this other stuff, and you end up with a monstrosity that has mushed them together. Yeah, he got it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, that's no fun. But this isn't a talk about shitting on containers. Containers are great for deployment and distribution. They just leave something to be desired during development, and that's all I'm saying. We can have nice things. So cool, 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 how does it work? All right, so Flux uses Nix for cross-platform reproducible environments. I just spent the last two days running NixCon across the street. Uh, <laughs> so clearly Flux loves Nix. Nix is great, has a lot of power, has a lot of flexibility, but the learning curve is extremely steep and causes a lot of people to bounce off of it. Has a lot of paper cuts. And another thing is that uh, you know, you probably, you're pretty familiar with your package manager, install, uninstall, whatever. Uh, you're also probably pretty uh, familiar with your language tooling. So, you know, cargo run, npm run, pip install, whatever the case may be. You go to Nix, none of that is helpful. Um, in order to build your software with Nix, you have to write a program in a lazily evaluated functional programming language that nobody has ever heard of. And that's where people bounce off because 
what the hell is that about? All right, so let's briefly talk about what Nix is. So uh, there's a lot of players in the ecosystem. So capital N Nix. This is the name of the ecosystem and the name of the programming language. You use this language to configure your builds, your development environments, and some other stuff. All right, lowercase n Nix. This is the CLI. You use it to start your builds, enter your development environments, stuff like that. Nix packages. Nix packages is a package repository and a standard library for building software. So it has helper functions for compiling a Rust project, building a Python application, whatever the case may be. Um, and we're going to talk about that package repository aspect a little bit in a second. But the next piece is uh, NixOS, which is not relevant for this talk, but a lot of people have heard about Nix and NixOS and get them confused. NixOS is a Linux distribution that's built and configured with the Nix language. So Nix can do a lot of stuff, everything from creating a text file all the way up to configuring an entire operating system. So like I said, power and flexibility. So Nix packages, like I said, is a package repository, but it doesn't actually contain the binaries or the source code, but it contains our recipes. And these recipes are essentially uh, expressions written in the Nix language that are functions of inputs to outputs, where the inputs are the build dependencies, and the output is some artifact. So again, this could be a text file, could be your compiled binary. Um, and the thing is, these inputs are also recipes. And so it's actually recipes all the way down, so you get an entire dependency tree of recipes. And then at build time, it actually goes in and essentially locks that entire dependency tree. So you get an entire locked dependency tree all the way down to libc. And this is one of the things that makes Nix development environments uh, so bulletproof. Uh, so rather than depending on you know, the version of libfoo that happens to be in user lib at this moment in time, you're depending on a specific absolute path in what's called the Nix store. So um, I'll explain the Nix store in a moment. But another thing that makes Nix built software so bulletproof is that dynamic libraries are kind of hard coded in. So I've run readelf on the hello package. And you can see that we have this library run path. This is the uh, set of paths that the linker knows to look in to load dynamic libraries. And you see that we have, uh, where's my mouse? Mouse is nowhere to be found, all right. Uh, slash nix slash store some hash and glibc. So this is a particular hashed version of libc, and it's hard coded in here. Uh, what this means is that it's effectively impossible to link the wrong uh, dynamic library, and it essentially becomes statically linked. So, like I said, this is one of the things that makes nix built software uh, so bulletproof. Um, the nix store. So. Uh, in terms of heaviest objects in the universe, it ranks even above the venerable node packages. Um, so the Nix store is essentially a giant immutable build cache, and inputs are pulled from that build cache, and then artifacts are then placed into it as well. Um, so during that locking process, um, the artifact is assigned a hash that's put in its file name, and that hash is computed from the hashes of all the inputs. Um, and those have in hashes in their names, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, the artifact essentially has a hash that's fingerprinted by its entire dependency tree. And that's one of the things that makes software built with Nix so reproducible, and then why we use it. So cat sitting in your lap registers somewhere between black hole and node modules. Anybody that has a cat knows that once it's in your lap, you're physically incapable of getting up. So with that, Done explaining, uh, I'll open it up to questions. Uh, there's a couple of places to check out. Oh, there's some links that didn't show up. There we go, third one, cool. So flocks.dev, uh, good place to find us. Uh, the command line itself is open source, it's GPL2. Uh, and so I've also written about you know, the release that we just did, you can find that on my blog. There's also stuff on flocks.dev. So give it a try. Um, like I said, we just did 1.0 on Wednesday, um, and we're looking for feedback. And we'd love to hear what you're thinking. Uh, you know, what does it do that you love? What does it not do that you wish that it did? 
stuff like that. So with that, time for questions. Yeah, what are the Oh, I don't know if it's working or not. Uh, how does this compare to like uh, DevBox? I know I've got some few folks. Sorry. Is this working? Yeah, yeah it's, it's on. Working. I just it's uh, muffled. How, how does this compare to DevBox? Right, like seems to do a similar thing. Right, like put some sugar on top of Nix, shave off some rough edges. We got people in my company playing with it. Uh, uh, so I'm a little more familiar with that. But I'm curious. Yeah, yeah. The, so the um, just to restate the question, how does this compare to DevBox? Is that the general idea? So. Um, in some places we've chose, uh, we've made similar choices. In other places we've made different ones. But ultimately the goals are pretty much the same. So we want to make it such that people can benefit from Nix without having to know Nix. Because uh, like I said, uh, a lot of people just bounce off and end up never touching Nix again. So um, there's a couple of uh, like key differences. So one is we're laser focused on that u uh, user experience. So we provide more... Uh, I would say like breadcrumbs. And so for instance, if you were to search for a package that doesn't exist, say you made a typo or something like that, um, today we give you like a suggestion as to like, hey, maybe you meant this instead, something like that. So there's, uh, there's those. Um, also, um, I, I'm not aware um, of any like hook functionality that DevBox provides. So I think they provide like a invarc file. I'm, I'm not super familiar with the product, but I think they provide an invarc file that, uh, and just one of them, um, that you can provide uh, like environment variables. Maybe you can put a script in there. I'm not sure because I, I don't use the product. But um, so our hook functionality is a bit richer. So you have essentially two types of scripts that you can add to your environment. One is sourced by your environment. So this uh, allows you to create shell aliases for your particular shell um, and also you know, create environment variables that are inherited. And then another type of script is always like exec in a bash subshell. So say that you want some like heavy duty initialization, um, but you don't want to have to worry about uh, cross shell compatibility. Um, there's, uh, you know, that's an example of when you'd use this like bash exec functionality. Um, I, I think I made a, a list of these uh, like differences um, in a comment somewhere. So I'm forgetting them offhand. I have ADHD, sorry. Um, but uh, yeah, so I mean, there, there are similar goals, but there's uh, a handful of differences that I think um, add up to a, just a better user experience. So earlier when you were uh, showing us your demonstration and it didn't compile, yeah, uh, that just looked like the they had changed the recipe, which was one of your dependencies for your build, and it broke everything. How does that differ from like a container being built at a different time? Because it seems like you had built this in the past. You build it again now, and it's broken just like a container would be if you built it at a different time. Yeah, yeah. so... Uh, spoiler, I have a development version running in this VM, uh, so I, I think I tweaked something that, uh, that broke it. But um, I can actually show you these environments. You get a, a lock file that locks the, uh, all the, here, let's stop that and kill this. And what is it? Um, dot flocks in manifest dot lock. So you get a lock file that contains uh, a specific uh, like hash of the input. The input is like Nix packages in this case. Um, and that also points to a specific revision. So as long as you have the same lock file, it will always activate the same exact environment. And so you can see up here um, it has uh, like there's a lock for each particular package, tells you exactly which attribute in Nix packages it was, um, you know, revisions, stuff like that. So as long as you have the same uh, lock file, you'll always get the same environment. And if you're not running a dev build, you'll get the same lock file from the same manifest. Yeah. Oh, because your, your dev build didn't look at your lock file. My, uh, my dev build did something different, yeah. Gotcha. Okay, so if I gave this lock file to a friend of mine, yeah. and I told him to build, it will build with this version, with this lock file. 
Yes, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Okay, that's better. <laughs> yeah. Okay, and the other question I had for you was, uh, so you, you set up this website, you set up this repository and stuff. How does Flox plan on paying for this service, or how does it, how does yeah, it yeah. exist to, to yeah, good. Truly? So the question was, uh, essentially, how do we expect to make money? Yeah. So, um, so everything that I just showed you today is free. Um, like I said, Flox is GPL2 licensed, the command line tool. Um, so we're planning to build out a set of features that are useful for teams and organizations. So uh, one feature is because we have that entire dependency tree as recipes, it's easy for us to generate a software bill of materials. Um, and so once you have that, you can scan that for vulnerabilities. And so, so that's something that enterprises care about. Um, another feature is uh, like private catalogs. So say that you build software with Flox, you want to push it somewhere and then consume it from Flox environments elsewhere. So we give you, we'll be able to give you a private catalog that uh, has your you know, organization specific artifacts. Um, another one, it, you might want to take open source uh, like packages and then apply your own like tweaks to them, your own patches. That's another way that you'd use the, use the private catalog, stuff like that. Yeah, does that make sense? Uh, I wasn't sure what was what else was in the dot uh, flux directory, but I was curious if the manifest lock and the toml can be committed to source control. Yeah, so basically, uh, you can commit that entire dot flux directory. Um, it actually has a git ignore file in it, so that because uh, in dot flux, depending on you know what kind of environments you're using, uh, there might be some symlinks in there, and so obviously you don't want those in source control. So the whole dot flux directory, you commit it. It has uh, a git ignore if there's stuff that you don't want to commit. Um, yeah, but the manifest.toml and manifest.lock are the ones that like you definitely want in there. Yeah. Uh, we, can you hear me? Very quiet. How about now? Still quiet. Yeah, just talk a little louder. Okay. All right. So, quick question. What about uh, is there a way to handle secrets? Uh, currently, we don't have a way to handle secrets. Uh, that's probably another thing that we can add to like the premium offering. Uh, yeah. So right now we're just focused on uh, the like local dev workflow. So if you, <laughs> I keep faking them out with the mic. Uh, so you can you could have an environment. Um, let's say that you had private environments. That's another thing that's kind of on the roadmap. Um, if you have a private environment and you put something in an environment variable there, you could activate that and then get access to it. But pro like, you probably want a more robust way to handle secrets. Um, but yeah, so you could use that for like some kind of credentials that are not like, you know, life altering or something. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So m maybe a, a slightly lengthy question. Like, it's about the path to production, right? So like thinking about the entire cycle Right, once the application is pushed out the prod, it's still going to run in a container on Kubernetes or whatever, that yeah. kind of stuff, right? So, in the case of like binary, whatever I'm building with Golang or Rust or something like that, sure, I have my local development environment. Maybe I'm running Flux in my CI, producing a binary and dropping it on some like distroless Alpine, whatever kind of a container. But let's say it's more, I don't know, Python, Ruby, whatever kind of dynamic uh, languages. So, like, I'm still going to have to build that container for production that will match Flux in some way, and then, right? Like, like yeah. either duplicating the work or feeling that pain of, like, is it actually? No. Nope. So we, we've thought of that. So Nix actually has uh, functionality built in to uh, take a shell or some other, what they call derivation, um, essentially take a Flux environment and bundle that whole thing up into a container. So you have a Flux environment that brings in uh, specific Python packages, you know, whatever the case may be, um, and it will just wrap all that up into a container that has them there for you. Uh, cool. Um, Docker Compose, useful. Your example UI backend mm -hmm. running mm -hmm. multiple services. Does Flux handle that those services, or is it still like maybe you should use Docker Compose with so Flux doesn't have a service management component today, but it's definitely on the roadmap, and it's something that we've talked about. Um, 
because obviously you want to be able to take all the stuff that you bring into your environment with Flux and then orchestrate it somehow. So um, today you might use something like Overmind or you know some, something that uses like a proc file or whatever the case may be. Um, you could also use Docker Compose. Um, but yeah, that's definitely it's something that's top of mind. Yeah. Um, so what if I did want to apply a patch but not like uh, apply a patch to a public package and then push it up to uh, Nick's packages? Like how long would that take before I can actually start using it? So I, I heard the first half. Oh, like. Um, can you hold the mic a little bit closer? Oh. Um, like, if I what if I want to apply a patch to some package? Like, I say I know there's a vulnerability, or I, I, I want to just, just make it be better. And I push that up to Nick's packages. How long do I have to wait before it comes down uh, into Flux? So uh, the question is essentially, if how long before something hits Nick's packages before you can consume it from Flux? Is that kind of the idea? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, once it's in Nick's packages. Um, right now, the Flux catalog is based on like the release branch. So like right now, it's release 23.11, I think, is, is the current one. Um, so I think it's like the same day. Like it depends on how long it goes, how long it takes to filter through the next packages, like you know, process because there's a bunch of different branches and merges that happen. Um, but yeah, so if you wanted to uh, make that patch like immediately available, you might. You know, do the private catalog thing that we'll be offering in the future, and it would take, you know, however long it takes to publish, like a few seconds, um, something like that. Yeah. Seeing no further questions, I relinquish the microphone. Thank you all for your attention. <laughs>